It's been over two and a half months since I made my first video on the Game Kitty 350H, and I have to say that I was honestly losing hope that this thing would manage to launch in 2019 at all. Well, with half a month left in the year, the 350H is finally sliding onto the scene. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and today we're going to be covering the long and awaited Game Kitty 350H. I do want to do a little disclaimer before we get started. I still have no idea how anyone can buy the metal version of this unit outside of China, which is probably one of the biggest disappointments of the year, as this thing is honestly one of the best devices on the market to this day. Let's kick things off with the specs of this device. The 350H is powered by a MIPS CPU clocked in at 1.5 GHz with the ability to overclock to 1.9 GHz. It comes with 128 megabytes of RAM, which may seem terrible, but it's perfectly adequate for the software that this device supports. They have upgraded the internal SD card to 32GB, up from the 16GB found in my previous model. This unit still includes a 2300mAh battery which should get you around 5 hours of gameplay and a best in class 3.5 inch 320x240 IPS display. One of the biggest differences in this retail version are all of the various colors that you can buy. My original reviews were all based on the clear black shell, but I find that this is inferior to all of the new color options that are available. We also have new color buttons and new joystick options. I've mentioned this numerous times in my other reviews, but this device unfortunately only has a single set of shoulder buttons, which could be a big deal breaker for you if you intend on playing PS1 games that require those buttons. Aside from this, we are going to be using micro USB for charging. To their credit, these shoulder buttons are pretty decent, but I don't like the hinge mechanism that they use. This is purely a personal preference type thing, and I do want to point out that the style of shoulder buttons used in this unit are probably the most common type in these Chinese handhelds. On to input, the D-pad on this device is super responsive to touch with a very good silicone membrane under the pad. This D-pad is virtually silent and only requires medium pressure to make contact with the board. We still have the same low profile joystick on this model which means that you can easily slide this thing into your pocket, but I would have loved if we could have had this with a little bit more texture on it because it doesn't have a good grip. There are only two sets of LEDs on the 350H and you'll be happy to know that these are tuned way down so you won't have to worry about being blinded by any overpowering lights. These things remain faint even in darkness. The A, B, X, Y keys have also been swapped for rainbow keys on some of these units, which makes this device the only 3.5 inch retro console that currently has rainbow keys in this generation. These keys are above average in terms of comfort and input. They only require a small amount of pressure for input and they are not as loud as some of the other handhelds that I've reviewed so far. I don't talk about this when I do reviews on these devices, but latency on these systems is much lower than anything you would get with a Bluetooth controller hooked up to your phone. I've talked about the screen on this device at length, and I plan on covering it more in a follow-up video. Simply put, this is the best 3.5 inch screen that I've seen in any handheld so far. It's super vivid with the same great viewing angles found in other IPS panels, but the overall clarity of the image is far superior to any other product. This means that you are going to be able to enjoy this product in more places. One of the newer colors in this retail launch is the frosted transparent case, which is 100% better than the black one in my opinion, but I'm going to be swapping it for a transparent blue case to illustrate how easy it is to mod this device. At this point, I don't know if these cases will go on sale as accessories, but it would be really nice to finally have that as an option with one of these Chinese handhelds. I personally feel that people are going to be a little disappointed with how big the logo is on this case, given that the name is certainly not the best, but I do like that we have a retro handheld that doesn't have a 50 point font logo right on the front screen for once. In terms of switching the shells, there really isn't much to it aside from swapping out some of the components between the cases. The first thing that we need to do is remove the back cover and disconnect the battery pack. Then we follow this up by removing the six back screws. I need to swap out the shoulder buttons on this, but it's pretty painless. You only need to remove two components. I also need to switch over the speakers between the units, but this speaker doesn't use any wires, so there isn't really anything to worry about here. There also isn't an external glass screen cover to worry about with this, so you can easily move the entire PCB with the screen connected into your new shell and snap it into place. This blue unit is actually sold with rainbow keys, but I think that this looks much better with a full set of black keys on the front. 
Before jumping into the rest of the video, I do want to say that even though the box says this thing supports CPS3, you will probably only get around 6 FPS if you overclock to 1.9 GHz. In terms of testing and reviewing this device, I already have 4 other videos that you can watch which should give you a really good idea of what this thing is capable of doing, and I would encourage you to check them out if you are thinking about buying the system and you haven't watched any of them yet. This device is very good at emulating a host of systems, and with 500MHz more than any of the other 3.5 inch handhelds, it has more power to do that emulation. With the open source software where it currently is, the only thing that this device cannot do is play PS1 games that use L2 and R2, or a second joystick. This thing can emulate GB, GBC, GBA, NES, SNES, Master System, Genesis, PS1, PC Engine, MAME, FBA, Neo Geo, Wonderswan, and Lynx out of the box. Due to not having a GPU, there are things that can't be easily ported over from the RG350 development, but as it currently stands, there really isn't anything of real value that you'll be missing out on with this device. That being said, if the stars ever do align and we get more N64 development on the RG350 and Pocket Go 2, that will not work on this device. I was lucky enough to get the developer of this unit to answer some burning questions about this device, so I will be adding subtitles to this video so you can read his responses. How long did it take to design this product? Why did you decide not to use the 4770 chip in this device? 因为四七七零，它是这个，就是已经停产的芯片，已经很多年了，然后不能长期供应，所以我们用了新方案。How did you come up with the name for this new company? 因为我的小孩呀，他啊，因为我做这个游戏机的时候，我的小孩很喜欢去看人家玩那个手机上的游戏，我经常叫他这个小鬼，我习惯这个叫他什么小鬼什么小鬼。Given how powerful this system is, why did you decide to use only a single set of shoulder buttons in one joystick? What was the most challenging part of this product launch? My name is Taki, and I've been your host on this review. If you like what you saw here and you want to support the channel, please consider dropping a like and subscribe to the channel for future reviews. I'll catch you here again with another review later. Now go out and enjoy the rest of your day. Taki out.